Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Ardo Cal here with you every Tuesday and Thursday, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well on the NHL on ESPN YouTube. Big news out of Edmonton. Coach Jay Woodcroft, assistant coach Dave Manson, relieved of their duties. And a bunch of coaches in their place, Chris Noblock, Paul Coffey, are coming in. Uh, obviously, this was a topic of conversation for a while now. The Edmonton Oilers start 3-9-1 and one in their first 13 games to start the season. A lot of question marks in oil country right now, and that's why we're bringing in Jason Greger, who hosts the Jason Greger Show on Sports 1440 in Edmonton, as well as the co-host of the Daily Faceoff podcast. To break this all down, uh, Jason, why don't we just start with Jay Woodcroft to begin with? There were question marks there. We were wondering if he was on the hot seat. We were also wondering if he might get a little bit more time with perhaps some changes on the ice before looking at Jay Woodcroft. How surprised are you at the timing of his firing? Well, a little bit. Um, I think the San Jose loss, ultimately, when you lose to the worst team in the league and uh, you can't score, your power play can't get your key goals, and... I, I think, you know, what were they at that point? Uh, two, nine, and one. Um, you know, Ken Holland admitted that uh, the decision was made before the Seattle game that Edmonton won, which makes sense to me. If you think you're going to fire the coach, you can't say, oh, we'll give him one more game. You've made your decision or not. I will say I think it's unfair. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very blunt on that. Um, the Edmonton Orders, this will be their third coach now in the, in the last four years and 14 games. They've made the playoffs all four of those years, and now you're on their third coach. Like, at some point, the players have to buy into the fact that they need to be more consistently responsible defensively. That's just a fact. They have the Oilers' weakness forever has been goals against. And they did buy in for the last 40 games last year. They led the league in scoring, and I think they were fifth or sixth in goals against. But then in the playoffs, they kind of reverted back to their high risk decision making and then that continued in this season like if you look at how many goals against the orders gave up and trust me i know goaltending is bad we'll probably get to that too but <laughs> their decision making as a group has not been good enough uh they take too many high risk moves and i guess the one thing that you could say about woodcroft is he never held any of his top minute eater guys like i'm talking top six forwards top four defensemen you know sit him down for a half a period Right. I'm not talking benching guys in the press box or anything. Right. You're not going to do that. But if Jonathan Huberdo and Johnny Gaudreau can get sat down, guys, by a rookie head coach, I think the coach in Edmonton, if that's the one area where you'd look to say he could improve, that would be it. But that's the only one. Like his winning percentage was great. His points percentage was great. So, you know, for him to get fired, I, I think is unfair, but it's the reality of the NHL sometimes. Help me figure out something about this team. So famously, their actual defensive numbers suck. Um, but their underlying numbers, both offensively and defensively, were pretty good under Woodcroft this season. And the thing I kept hearing about in the aftermath of his firing was his decision that he made to kind of tweak their system, to get away from man-to-man -man D, try to play more of a zone D that like Boston likes to play. How much of that learning curve has made players like Darnell Nurse and Evan Bouchard look as terrible as they have. Um, you know, how much of that decision has led towards them being so bad in practicality defensively this year? Honestly, guys, I think it's an excuse, Greg. Um, oh, yeah. It's okay. funny because because Chris Knobloch, what does Chris Knobloch say when I asked him? Well, I actually feel really more comfortable playing zone defense, <laughs> right? Yeah. In, in, the, in the kind of a hybrid zone. I talked to a lot of players who have played. They're like, guys, there's really three, three defensive structures really at the end of the day. And you've all played it at some level at a different one. It's more about execution. And I think it comes down to the, the team got here September 1st. They had their captain skates, right? Um, if the coach was going to implement zone, uh, you know, he'd send those guys a note. Hey guys, we're going to play this. All right, we'll practice it. Like it's not that hard, right? Like you literally, and, and some guys will tell me, it's actually easier. You stay in your quadrant as a defense when you have less place to go. So mm -hmm. you're like, hey, if I cover this eight foot space, I should be okay, right? Um, and and the one thing that zone zone never teaches you, hey guys, let's just vacate the slot, and hey, let's just give up odd man rush after odd man rush. None of that because the orders were getting absolutely murdered 
in odd man rushes um, early on this season. But the thing is, if you look, they did go back to before the Heritage Classic. They went back to their man to man. And um, you know what? What's that resulted in them going two and four? Yeah. Wasn't any better. Right. And one of those wins was the Seattle win when Woodcroft was essentially already fired. So Edmonton has shown when they actually decide to commit to team defense, Calgary game, Seattle game, Winnipeg game, they gave up very little. And then all of a sudden in the other games, they're like, well, let's play river hockey. I, I think it's the system. Should it take three or four games? Okay. But it can't take 12 or 13. And it doesn't excuse you when you're playing. Cause if you look at some of the defensive miscues, they happen at the offensive blue line or in the neutral zone where they're just not picking up a guy or they're ta- they're Oh, I'm going to try to pinch here when I got zero chance. Like, mm. like I'd have a better chance of growing a full head of hair than they had in some of the pinches being successful. <laughs> and we both know that that's not going to happen. <laughs> well, we do know that you're going to have to grow some hair, which we're all looking yeah. forward to. Uh, no, trust me, everybody lost. but me, right. It's going to be <laughs> awful. So. Um, going back to the Woodcroft firing for just a second here, there is a sentiment out there that Connor McDavid's former agent gets hired as CEO in uh in the Edmonton Oilers organization maybe he's gaining power maybe he has something to do with this how much credence should we give to that uh I'll say that optically yeah sure it probably doesn't look great but um Knobloch and McDavid like that's eight years ago that they were together and Chris Knobloch even said he goes like I might have texted him once or twice but we really haven't talked in in eight years right like like how many players talk to their junior coach regularly Right. Not many, if, if we're being honest, like if they see each other and you bump in and, you know, I'm sure when McDavid scored his 150th point, maybe you sent him, hey, man, congratulations. But, uh, you know, Chris Knobloch has been a name that's out there for a while. Um, you know, I know he was in the running for the Rangers and obviously they went uh, with a more established coach and, and that's fine. Um, I, it's funny, Knobloch actually benched McDavid and Erie. So this might be the best thing. They're going to have a coach who's going to hold some guys accountable. But I do understand the optics of it. Um, people will wonder and say, hey, why was Gerard Gallant, Bruce Boudreaux, you know, some other established coaches not better? Well, I don't, I can't really criticize giving a young coach an opportunity when too often I think they recycle the same old coaches. So to me, I'd be a hypocrite if I do that. Um, you know, Chris Knobloch, I've talked to guys who played for him in Hartford. They love him. They think he's very connected. He, he is a positive coach, but he's also very system detailed. And I'm going to be curious to me, if Knobloch can hold them accountable, then that to me is going to be the main thing. But ultimately, it's going to be up to the players to decide. Um, Knobloch had a pretty good observation about McDavid. I know everyone's like, oh, because McDavid, guys, as we're recording this, he's 130th in league scoring. Yeah, Connor McDavid is 130th. So, um, like, is that Jay Woodcroft's fault? No. Like Jay Woodcroft has never been coaching him to say, Hey, let's not produce. Um, I know some people say he's banged up, but Connor McDavid spent 15 minutes after practice last week, working with Dylan Holloway in a battle drill. And and when asked about it, he said, I got to get out of this funk. And the only way to get out of it is work harder. Like he's averaging the most minutes of any forward in the league. Like he usually does at 22 minutes. Is he a little banged up? Yeah, probably guys, but not to the level that it's detrimental to the point. He should be like this. I just think him and Leon dry look human right now they're fighting it they're lacking confidence they're struggling and so Knobloch said his biggest thing with McDavid and he knows him and it's probably that's the one advantage he'll have when he steps into that first meeting Connor looks across and is like okay I trust this guy I played with him for three years we had lots of success he knows me if he says something you're probably a little bit more likely to want to listen to it right away so that's the advantage Knobloch has. Correct. Gregor, let's let's cut. We've mentioned optics. Let's cut right to the JFK conspiracy theory of it all. Like Jeff Jackson's is was Connor's agent. He praised yeah. Knobloch in the past for the way that he developed not only McDavid but other young players that Jeff had sent there. I don't believe for a second that McDavid, as the franchise's most important player, didn't have some level of sign off on who the next coach was going to be. And then on top of that, with the, the 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 star player and his former agent picking the new coach. You have Paul Coffey coming on the bench, a narc for the owner, Daryl Cates. Who, I mean, a, a guy who joined the organization as a consultant to the owner who has never been 
a coach before in the National Hockey League who is one now and is clearly there to play hall monitor for the owner along with the handpicked coach of the star player and the CEO. Tell me I'm wrong. Well, that is the one thing that is head scratching for sure. Um, you look at it and they couldn't say everything, but what you just described is how a lot of people are going to view it. That's just a fact, right? Um, whether it's true or not, like, is Paul Coffey going to be a narc God? I'd like to think not, but you, you like Paul Coffey, I think has lots of power in the organization. Um, you know, because you got the ear of the owner, right? Um, now Marty St. Louis has never coached in NHL. He got the head coach job in Montreal. He's done well. Like Paul Coffey's a smart dude. And, and Paul Coffey, the one thing he said was with his defense, hey, I want those guys to learn, you know, the odds, which made a lot of sense to me. Stop taking low risk plays. I mean, high risk plays with low reward. So if you can do that, it'll help. But I'm curious how long Coffey stays, right? That That's what I'm a little bit curious about here. Is this just, if he's here all year and is going to be long-term, then maybe it is different. But I can't recall an assistant coach who's also being an advisor. Like, I don't think it's ever happened guys. Like, tell me I'm wrong. Like, obviously I don't study every coaching staff in the history of the NHL, but um, it does seem odd for sure. It reeks of, and, and, and it screams dysfunction. Um, so, you know, people look and say, well, are you telling me there was no other defensive coach that you wanted? Now, Mark Stewart's on the staff still, right? Mark Stewart's former NHL defense when he's coached for a long time. So I wonder is coffee here and and we're going to see that Stewart eventually takes over the blue line. I wonder about that. That's my my only thing here is that is coffee here temporarily and if he is is that because he wants to get a better sense of what's in the room and rather than always firing coaches, right? Is that what we're seeing which again is very odd, don't get me wrong, it's odd, mm-hmm. but yeah, that, that's the one, t- like the Knobloch one, I don't have much of an issue with. The coffee one is definitely one that raises more, more flags because you're like, now he's a Hall of Fame player. I think he understands the game very well, no question, but he's an advisor to the owner. And yeah. that, like, how is that going to play out in the room when you're talking to guys and it's like, well, geez, if I'm having a conversation here, is this going directly to the owner? What's going on here? Like, I'm not saying coffee's an art, but I don't know. And like, Daryl Cates is the owner. What if he's like on the phone every day? What do they say? What's going on? Like what's happening? That's definitely going to be a conversation. That dude is, that dude is straight up jump street. That guy's a narc all the way, all the way, man. <laughs> that guy is, that guy's bugging the room. He's telling Cates about, I, I, no question about that. But at, at the end of the day, Gregor, like you said, that could be a good thing because it does add that level of like, we better be really on our toes because we have a direct line to the owner watching us from the bench at all times. Like it could be that too. Sorry, Arda, go ahead, buddy. I was just going to say, Paul Coffey's going to show up backwards hat, skateboard in hand. How do you do, fellow <laughs> kids? That's what's happening. He's going to walk into the locker room. <laughs> no, nothing well, to see here, people. <laughs> but, but it does It does illustrate, like, there's a lot of pressure in Edmonton. Don't get me wrong. Everybody knows that the orders are in that window, whatever that magical window is. Although, I'm not a big believer in the window garbage. I think some windows now are a decade long. Just ask Ovi till he finally won a Stanley yeah. Cup. Like, it's yeah. hard to do, yeah. right? So... But there is a lot of pressure here, no question. Um, is this an un- unconventional move? A hundred percent. And we'll see if it works out, guys. Like the, the only, like the one saving grace they have here is the orders can't be this bad, this long. Like their talent. You look, they've created the fourth most high danger chances in the league, and they're twenty seventh in scoring. Like how is that even possible? Like I don't get it. So yeah. um, you know, eventually they'll get better. Now the one thing that that this didn't address. Can they get better goaltending, right? They Their defensive system has to be better or their defensive commitment, I should say, not even the system. Their defensive commitment has to be better, but they need more saves from their goaltender. It's so like Stuart Skinner. It's funny. Jack Campbell's in the minors, but Stuart Skinner is the one who actually has worse numbers, Yeah. right? But you, you couldn't put him on waivers because someone would claim him. He's a young goalie, and we all know that goalies are voodoo. And, uh, you know, somebody might claim Stuart Skinner and he's going to turn into their Aiden Hill and win the Stanley cup for goodness sakes. Like it happens all the time, right? Jordan Binnington was the fifth goalie in the organization. And six months later, he's hoisting the Stanley cup, like outside of your top six goalies, you really don't know from year to year what the hell you're going to get. Like, look at the Islanders who the orders are play on Monday. Sorokin's got a nine Oh seven save percentage. This guy is considered one of the top three goalies in the league and he's below average yeah. right now. So you know what? Honestly, it's the one position I rarely, you know, unless I got a Vasilevsky or a few other guys, like it's like you come into the season and you're literally 
You start with your eyes like this, guys, over my glass. Oh, oh, gee, okay, our goalies are good. Here we go. Because honestly, like, you don't know outside of a few guys what you're going to get between the pipes. Jason Greger show on Sports 1440 in Edmonton, co-host of the Daily Faceoff podcast, literally pulled over to the side of the road to do this for us, as you can see. Jason, really appreciate it, man. Thanks for joining us on The Drop. Boys, thanks for having me. Have a good one. Big thanks to Jason Greger for joining us, talking about the immediate future of the Edmonton Oilers, our immediate future in the world of hockey, of course, the Hockey Hall of Fame. On Monday night, the new class was inducted. Pierre Turgeon, Henrik Lundqvist, Mike Vernon, Tom Barrasso, Carolyn Ouellette, Ken Hitchcock, and Pierre Lacroix. Certainly a goaltender-heavy class. Uh, but yeah. every time we get to this portion of the year, Always the conversation comes up who should go in the uh, decisions that have been made surrounding the hockey hall of fame. It's always fun to talk about it, which as a hockey fan. So we figured let's look back on Monday night and let that color the conversation. Uh, let's look ahead to the class of 2024. And there are some very interesting names, wish that now become eligible to enter the hall. Yeah, I mean, let's establish first that I'm a Hall of Fame geek, and I'm also a very strict constructionist of the Hall of Fame. Like, I would probably take the top five players from every era and then cut it there. Uh, a Pierre Turgeon, wow. for example, a Tom Barrasso, a Mike Vernon, they would not be in my Hall of Fame. A Henrik Lundqvist would be welcomed with open arms to put a recent example into practice. Now, the biggest question about very the big class of you, of by the way, as a Devils fan, that was very, very big of you. I, I, sure. I know, I know, I can, I can reach across the aisle and and pat someone on the back for a Hall of Fame career, um, <laughs> and not being as good as Marty Berdor. But listen, the biggest question for twenty twenty four, and maybe the years beyond that, Arda, is the Russia question. There was not a Russian player inducted in the class of twenty twenty three, despite the outcry that Alexander McGillney should be in that class. Uh, it is no secret that since Russia invaded Ukraine, Russia has been ostracized in the hockey community. You have the IIHF banning Russia and Belarus from world championship tournaments. The NHL can't figure out what the hell to do with the World Cup of Hockey because they don't know uh, how to incorporate Russian players but not incorporate Russia. So... We don't know what the selection committee thinks about this. We don't know what they think about anything. It's the most clandestine group that we have in hockey as far as their methods of madness. But if we are to believe that Russia is being ostracized in the hockey community, and we are to believe that the Hall of Fame does not necessarily want to put the shine on Russian players, as Rob Rossi reported earlier this year, he had someone tell him, you're not going to see a Russian player inducted until the invasion's over. Um, whether that's true or not, we have to consider the fact they might take this into consideration when building a class that is, that is essentially there for marketing purposes, to sell tickets, to get people to come to the Hall of Fame. That established. The best candidate for the Hall of Fame in 2024 is Pavel Datsuk, former Detroit Red Wing, one of the most influential players of his generation. A amazing talent, but also someone where you had guys from Nico Heischer to, Le to Leon Dreisaitl saying, I consumed film of this guy to learn how to play defense. Uh, to go down the list real quickly behind him, Arda, our old friend Alex McGilney, you and I have talked about it before, the idea that he's got the numbers and he's got the story. When you talk about the Hall of Fame, you want to talk about players that had an impact on the game, becoming the first uh, major star to defect from Russia to the U.S. in the late 1980s makes him that guy. Behind him, Ilya Kovalchuk, one of the greatest goal scorers of his generation, played on some awful teams. The question I had and the, and the question uh, that, that I think the selection committee will have is, you know, we got to remember how good he was. Because after he left the Devils in in, in twenty uh, in like I think it was like 2020, uh, 2014 or twenty thirteen, mm -hmm. he like went to the KHL. He came back to the NHL. He was like a journeyman player. You gotta remember how good this guy was, but he was great. Yeah. After him, first a uh, first year guy, uh, Ryan Miller, uh, at the peak of his powers, I think one of the best goalies in the league. Uh, I had Megan Doug uh, Megan Duggan of the U.S. Women's Team fifth. I think she's a very worthy candidate. Keep in mind, there's only been one time since women started to be inducted into the Hall of Fame where it's been a two-woman class, and that was the first year they did it. Uh, Sergey Gonchar, 
Henrik Zetterberg, who I think has moved ahead of Rod Brindamore as that next defensive center who gets in, uh, both of them trailing Datsuk. Jennifer Botterill, uh, a Canadian hockey legend. Then Shea Weber in his first year of eligibility and Keith Kachuk in his 10th year of eligibility. Um, of that list, anybody stand out for you? Yeah, Pavel Datsuk is uh, one of the most influential hockey players of his generation. The Datsuk flip. He was actually the first one, or I don't know if he was the first one in history, but he definitely tried the dish again before Trevor Zegras did. And I think that was back in 2012. So he was thinking of innovative ways to play hockey uh, well beyond his generation, let alone what we're currently seeing. And I'm sure that a lot of the young players that are as creative as they are on the ice right now take cues from Pavel Datsuk. Henrik Zetterberg, the latest draft pick in NHL history to win the Conn Smythe Trophy. So that's yeah. a cool little tidbit for him as well. Obviously, the big elephant in the room is Patrick Marlowe and whether he deserves Hall of Fame recognition. He has the record for most games played in NHL history. He's a thousand plus point guy. He has two Olympic gold medals. Wish, what do you think about his joining the Hall of Fame possibly? I think after the Russia question, the Patrick Marlowe question is the most compelling thing about the class of 2024. First year of eligibility. The problem with Marlowe, as you said, is he has the most games played in NHL history. That is an amazing record. That is a seminal record. That is one of those records that people thought would not be broken. He's got it. But the problem is he's played all those games and he has compiled an impressive number of stats. Compiler is a word that people throw out a lot at players that have impressive numbers through longevity, but never really hit that mark of God tier status, elite status, star player status. You could make the argument in all his years in San Jose Arda, he was not the player that Joe Thornton was, nor the player that Joe Pavelski is. And so the question the Hall of Fame selection committee is going to have to answer is having the greatest number of games played in NHL history, setting an impressive record, does that counterbalance and outweigh the fact that he was never really considered to be a top five elite player at any point in his career? Oh, and by the way, one other factor we should mention, a well-liked player. Sometimes that's the, the point of demarcation for the selection committee between one candidate and another. Do we like the guy? And there's certainly going to be fans of Patrick Marlowe's in that room. That's exactly what I was going to get to is... In this business, when you work in hockey long enough, you stop rooting for teams and you root for people. And there are a whole lot of people over the decades that have covered the NHL that would love nothing more than for Patrick Marlowe to receive his flowers and would not complain one bit if he were to be inducted in the Hall of Fame just because of how he conducted himself, never missing a media availability, no matter how bad the loss was or no matter what mood he was in. He was always there. He was always willing to talk. And he was a nice guy. He treated you the same, just like he treated his teammates. And so to your point, you, you've you mentioned this on a previous show, Wish. Sometimes it's the storyline. And Patrick Marlowe has a great one. So there wouldn't be too many people complaining, like I said, if he were to go into the Hall of Fame. Whether that should matter or not, that's a different thing. But as a human being, happy for him, the person, certainly that would be the case. All right, let's play this well, game. Hold oh, on. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me just say one thing before we get to the game. Uh, I do think that Ryan Miller is ahead of Pekka Rene. I know there's a lot of Pekka Rene fans out there. I think he had too many peaks and valleys in his career. If I was going to predict the actual class, Arda, for, mm -hmm. for, this, for 2024... If the Russia factor isn't a factor, I think it's going to be Datsuk, McGilney, Kovalchuk, and Shea Weber. If it is a factor, I think we get Kachuk. I think we get Zetterberg. And I think we get Shea Weber. I, I have a feeling mm -hmm. that although you can argue the merits of his case, and I think that there are arguments about it that we should certainly say maybe he hasn't had the career say that Sergei Gonchar did. I think Weber as Canadian hockey icon, Weber as a uh, two-time gold medalist, and also sure. the the notion of they they should probably find a way to get Shea Weber in before next year when uh, Zdeno Chara and Duncan Keith are both going to be first ballot guys in 2025. Yeah. I, I think he gets in regardless of the if it's the Russian class or the non-Russian class. I'd be surprised if he yeah. didn't actually. And Megan Duggan's a great choice uh, in either scenario. So both, she both absolutely her deserves and, it. 
both her and Botterill should get in on the yeah. on the same ticket. This yeah. nonsense of the Hall of Fame only putting in two women in the same class once that they can put in multiple women. There are some years when they didn't choose any women. The idea that they were going to someone once said to me, Arya, that they were worried they were going to run out of women to put in the Hall of Fame. I'm like, you're insane. What? Like, like Come on. internationally, the Canadian and American national teams Silly. that set the standard. Julie Chu being outside the Hall of Fame still insane. Megan Acosta. Like, there's so many other players that could be in the Hall of Fame now that are deserving. I know this will be remedied when we start to see the current national team players like Hillary Knight and 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 Plan and all these players like they, they start retiring and stuff. But man, just put in Duggan, put in Botterill, let them tell those stories and just stop I would, being so gatekeepy old boys yeah. club nonsense with your selection committee. I would actually waive the three year period for Hillary Knight, but that's a conversation for another day. I think she's earned it based on what she's done in the world of hockey. Uh put one in, take one out. Uh, if we're putting one player or or any anyone in the hockey world in and taking one out from the take one out part, it's going to be very interesting. I can't wait to hear what you have to say there. Uh, I'm going to go with easy answers for my put one in. Uh, I'm going to go Barry Melrose. I think he should be in. Put him in as a Foster Hewitt Award winner. He absolutely deserves it. He was the face of American hockey for a very long time, especially uh, when it was in its uh, low quote unquote years. He was always there beating the drum for hockey. Uh, and Alex McGillney, that's like the the thing is, is that he's in his 15th year wish. Like, just imagine how happy hockey fans will be when that finally happens. Yeah, I, I, incredibly deserving on the ice and off the ice. McGillney, uh, who are you? Uh, well, for me, I'm putting in. Uh, listen, I don't like the guy. I've been candid about this. We got some history. We got some beef. I'm not a huge fan of him as a person, but. Jeremy Roenick as a player is a Hall of Famer. Okay, 513 career goals, 42nd all-time, 43rd all-time in adjusted goals. And uh, his the peak of his powers that, that you know, several years run in the 1990s, without question, one of the elite centers in this league. And, um, you know, a big thing for me, Art, about the Hall of Fame is the fame part. And uh, to me, uh, as a young fan, uh, Jeremy Roenick was... Uh, for an American hockey fan, uh, the peak of of fame, yeah, uh, and and a cult of personality and a really one of a kind player. Um, never meet your heroes, but he does belong in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Maybe he belongs in twice: one as a player and one as the NHL '94 character. I wouldn't mind seeing <laughs> NHL '94 Jeremy Roenick get in the Hall of Fame too. Uh, by the way, this is the most mature podcast you've ever done. Like, Why? period. Lundquist, Ronick, like you're throwing flowers, unlike Look, we've ever seen. But good for you, man. Once, once you get to a, where we've once seen. you get to a certain age, man, you know, <laughs> like you, you, you mellow a little bit. You want to make peace. I'm a Pisces. It's my nature to make peace. Maybe we'll have Larry Brooks on as a guest at some point. Maybe we'll go all the way in the peacekeeping mode yes. of this podcast yes. that we're doing. I don't know. Who's to say, Arda, how many olive branches will grow on the drop? That's what we do. That's what we do here is we mend fences. Uh, speaking of mending fences, not at all. Who would we take out of the Hall of Fame? I, I'm actually going to reassign someone in the Hall of Fame. Okay. Vatslav Nedimansky is in as a player. Now, he broke a barrier he was the first player from czechoslovakia to play in the nhl to play in north america so like to have to you know get through the iron curtain that was in czechoslovakia to come into north america and play hockey is worthy of hall of fame induction in itself i would say put him in as a builder because he doesn't necessarily have the numbers per se to um, that others would to qualify as a player in the Hall of Fame. I get it. I'm not mad at it. I'm just saying reassigning as a player would be cool because, hey, then that's another sneaky way to get McGillney in because now we have a spot for a player. There you go. Uh, I am uh, taking out a guy named Dick Duff. Now, who is Dick Duff? How dare you? Don't you don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Arda might know because he's from he's a Toronto guy. Like, he, maybe he knows. <laughs> Dick Duff was enshrined in twenty in, in two thousand six. He retired in nineteen seventy two. It felt like at the time of his induction that a team of archaeologists somehow discovered Dick Duff and said, "This man belongs in a museum." Uh, I don't know what the selection process is. You don't know it either. The fact that Dick Duck, Dick Duff, is a well liked guy 
who for decades would charm people in interviews. He likely had some friends in the room, never received a vote for an NHL award. He has 572 career points. Eric. Venture a guess where that ranks in NHL history, where he is on the all-time leaderboard in points, Arda. Do you want to venture a guess, Dick Duff? Uh, low. <laughs> Where 412. Is it? <laughs> He's tied with Joey Juno in career points. He was the Stanley <laughs> Cup champion for the Leafs. So, in other words, it's another example of the echo chamber of the Hockey Hall of Fame selection committee. If you wore the blue pajamas and were nice to people, you're gonna be in the Hall of Fame. Not in my Hall of Fame, Dick Duff. Get the hell out of Toronto, baby. There's probably some other Toronto Maple Leaf Hall of Fame you can get into. Leave some for the rest of us. Dick Duff, out of the hall. Goodbye, sir. He did win six cups. He won two with Toronto and four with Montreal. Great. Congratulations. You played <laughs> with a bunch of really good players. and You uh, ma- you, you know what? It reminds me of the, of the time in the, like the, when, when they were like inducting the 20th guy on the Cincinnati Reds from the 1970s because they, he just happened to be there when Johnny Bench was there. Like, who can Dick Duff? This is just, this is supposed to tell the story of hockey. How am I supposed to tell my daughter? This is Dick Duff. I don't know what he did, but he's here. Let's move on to the other guys. Uh, that's hilarious. By the way, Dick Duff is an all-timer hockey name, too. What, what are you going to go after Newsy Lalonde next? Come on now. Never, never. <laughs> never, by not the way, Newsy. By the way, I found out Derek Lalonde, head coach of the Red Wings, nicknamed Newsy. They just like use Newsy yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in conversation about him. And I think that's lovely. That's a, a lovely hockey nickname that we should keep in circulation. People should know about Newsy Lalonde. He was more important than other players say like Dick Duff. Fair enough. Speaking of important players, Yarmir Yager. Speaking of longevity, we just talked about Patrick Marlowe. Yarmir Yager is still playing hockey in the Czech Republic, and he had quite the NHL career. His number, 68, will go up in the rafters at uh, in Pittsburgh, rightfully so. So we thought this might be a great opportunity uh, for the GOAT, the legend himself, Yarmir Yager, for us to rank The nine NHL teams, the stints that he had with those teams, let's rank them from worst to best, least memorable to most memorable. Just where, where do each, uh, where does each team rank in Yarmir Yager's NHL journey? This is going to be fun. So this, so this is, this is our, our our power ranking for the week. We're not going to rehash where the teams are mainly because I don't want to be mean to Edmonton again, but our power (laughs) ranking is basically the Yarmir Yager Eras tour. Where do we rank all of these things in the history of Yager? Let's start with the worst stint, Arda. Number nine, Calgary Flames. Mm-hmm. A sad, broken down Yarmir Yager who couldn't keep up with the kids anymore. Uh, plays out the string in Calgary. Uh, obviously, a, a unmemorable time for a legendary player. An easy call at number nine. The only thing I will say, the best part of his tenure with the Flames was we got the traveling Yagers on a broadcast with Yaromir Yager. So True. that was great. So I'm glad that happened. The traveling yeah. Yagers, if you don't know, are a bunch of friends uh, that come together to celebrate Yaromir Yager, and each of them wear a different jersey. The founder just passed away. I may rest oh. in peace. But they all came together, and they actually went to the Czech Republic recently to meet Yager and play some charity games there, which is really cool. Sweet. Number eight, the Dallas Stars. I remember Yager went there for tax purposes, I believe. Number seven, the New Jersey Devils. There's a lot of people don't even remember Yager played for Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, he was there. Uh, I do think people remember him playing for the Florida Panthers, number six on our journey through the Yager Eras Tour. Uh, maybe not the most impactful time, but definitely a memorable time uh, with him with the Florida Panthers. Can I add one Panthers- thing? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Add, add to oh, the Panthers. I was going to say that the Panthers have that curious history of like, Pavel Bure played for them and Yamir Yager played for them. That was a sort of a, th- and, and Joe Thornton played for them too, didn't he? Absolutely. Um, and that's, yeah. So it's that's, like, they've had a very interesting like, collection of legends. Yeah. And in many ways, they're like the MLS of uh, the NHL. Teams. <laughs> that's right. Exactly what happens. Uh, also though, <laughs> that's great. Um, one, uh, one cool moment that did happen while he was a member of the, pa- I think he was a member of the Panthers then was when uh, PK dressed up as him at the all-star game yes. and did the uh, breakaway. That was hilarious. That was great. So classic PK moment, a fantastic yeah. moment for the all-star game. The flyers at number five is interesting. I, that was the moment 
I think when he went to Philly, first of all, it was the moment when he pissed off all of Pittsburgh because they all thought that he was going to sign there. And then he signs with their arch rival. It's one of the reasons why it took him so long to figure out when they were going to retire this guy's number. Um, but it was the, <laughs> I remember the, the flyer stint art of being the first time that Yager had kind of morphed into that hockey Jedi mode of like, Claude Giroux telling stories of like his fitness and him running the stairs yes, in the practice yes, arena. Like yes. he'd be, I think this is when he kind of got to his Qui-Gon uh, era in the NHL is when he went to the Flyers in particular. So I always appreciated that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. When, when, when you hear those epic gym stories at like 1 AM in the hotel gym uh, that, you know, that, that, that's part of Yager lore. Uh, let me take number four, uh, the Boston Please. Bruins. So we're here for a good time, not a long time. To me, that's the Boston Bruins run. <laughs> and the reason I put it, I, I actually lobbied for this. I thought that the his Bruins stint should be higher on the list, even if he didn't spend a lot of time there. He did make a cup final run with that team. He did play every game in the playoffs. He did. I think he had 10 assists. So he was contributing. And that was, you know, had he won a Stanley Cup, it might have been even higher with the Bruins, I should say. So... For that reason, I think it's worthy of being higher on the list in the uh, Yager Eras Tour, Yaromir's version. Correct. Um, number three is the Washington Capitals. I mean, definitely the most infamous stop for Yager, uh, the trade from Pittsburgh to Washington, uh, him becoming a, a, a locker room cancer with the Capitals, only spending a few years there, a gigantic swing and a miss by the organization to have him be the focal point of the Caps. Um, but at the end of the day, Art, if it wasn't for the flame out of Yammer Yager in Washington, they probably would not have entered a deep rebuild. And if they didn't enter a deep rebuild, they would have not have earned Alex Ovechkin in the NHL draft. So thank you, Yammer Yager. You are directly responsible for the Ovechkin era in Washington, D.C. Do you think he got a ring in 2018? Did he get a cup <laughs> ring or 2017? Got probably. a ring at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he he he, he might have gotten a, a a chip of some sort at the poker tournament he was at, but probably not a <laughs> ring, uh, if we know Yager. Uh, number two is the New York Rangers. He did have a 50-goal season with them, spent a couple seasons there. Uh, and that was, was that really like the last time where we saw peak Yager? Yeah, for sure. I mean, he he was, he was nearly won the Hart Trophy. I, I, I remember being like neck and neck with him and Joe Thornton. Uh, for the heart while he was with the Rangers. But yeah, I mean, clicked really well there. A very vital player, an important player for uh, for the Rangers during that era. And uh, and certainly ranked second for us in the power ranking of Yager NHL stops. But number one, what are we even doing? I mean, you all know what number one is. Number one is the Pittsburgh Penguins. I mean, Yager flying down the ice, mullet flapping in the wind, Mario Jr., the whole thing. Uh, an iconic player during the 1990s uh, and forever a penguin. That's uh, It was a little touching this week to see Yager participating fully in the hype for his number retirement in Pittsburgh. Um, there and there haven't always been great times with him, him and Penguins fans. We talked about not only the going to the Flyers thing, but the, the divorce between him and the Penguins when he went to the Capitals and that trade was pretty nasty as well. Um, but at the end of the day, a penguin for life and somebody whose legacy in that city deserves all the accolades and recognition it's going to get when his number is hoisted to the rafters. And let's be honest, his Penguins era is better than the rest of his career combined. That, yeah. that He will always be remembered, as he should, as a member of the Pittsburgh Penguins. Wait one second. I have an impromptu search for merch for us. I just need to go get it. Give me one second. What? An impromptu search for merch on this very podcast? An impromptu moment in which we use our podcast to put the spotlight on a item that is from hockey lore or perhaps a giveaway a team uh, sends us to put our podcast and show you guys? Uh, well, I found this one on eBay and I am not selling this at all. Uh, but this is the Yaromir Yager creamy peanut butter <laughs> from the 90s. Uh, you got to find the picture. Maybe Andrea, our producer, can just put in the picture where he's like laughing at a giant pyramid of peanut butter. Um, and then the uh, Robo Penguin logo here, of course. I do want to point out one thing about this. Uh, I need to find it, though. Uh, this has an expiration date of 331.98. So this expired in 1998. Mm -hmm. Do you want to give it a try? You know... It's funny you should say that because I also have something I've wanted to try. It's a 10th anniversary bottle of wine 
from the Carolina Hurricanes. Okay. Uh, that I I think I still have my possession. And and the idea of us drinking expired wine and ex- and eating expired peanut butter. It may be the last episode of the drop. Uh, but it could be the best episode of the drop. <laughs> yes, and we'll stay on the air until we convulse, <laughs> and that'll be it. That's that's talking about talking about going out with a bang. That's what we're gonna do. Uh, that's it for us on this episode. Uh, I'll keep this uh, tight and sealed for now. But uh, thank you very much for listening. We'll be back on Thursday. Remember, wherever you get your audio podcasts and the NHL and the ESPN YouTube, we will see you then. Thanks for listening. Thanks everybody. 